All right. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> hope if you, if uh, Brendan, if you guys can hear me, wave. There we go. All right. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I've lost use of these machines. All right. So um, just flagging a couple of uh, SG interventions today. The Secretary General spoke by video conference to the third roundtable of renowned economists on the topic of rebirthing the global economy. And he, the Secretary General told them that we face not only an unprecedented crisis, but also the opportunity to make real foundational and necessary changes. He noted that many, that many more than one million, that many more than one million people have died from the COVID-19 pandemic, and more than 100 million people are being pushed into extreme poverty. At the same time, he added, we face an urgent need for climate action while recognizing that developing countries in particular are on the precipice of financial ruin. So we need global solidarity and global coordination. The Secretary General said he has been pushing for a new social contract at the national level with a strong emphasis on education as the main equalizer and access to the new digital economy and the new generation of social protection measures and of measures related to fair labor markets. We also need a new global deal at the international level, he said. Also earlier this morning in a pre-recorded video message um, to the 2020 Afghan conference, which is taking place in Geneva, uh, Antonio Guterres stressed that the people of Afghanistan face serious challenges including conflict, poverty, and the uneven application of the rule of law. The Secretary General noted the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified humanitarian and development challenges in the country. He said that he is also deeply concerned about the continued level, levels of high levels of violence and that the Afghan people have suffered far too long. The Secretary General urged redoubling of efforts towards an immediate, unconditional ceasefire in order to save lives and prevent the further spread of COVID-19. He said that we, we will create a conducive, that, <clears throat> excuse me, he added that this will create a conducive environment for the Afghan peace negotiations at Doha. And he also underscored that the Afghan women have paid a high price in the conflict while still playing a central role in creating a peaceful, inclusive in communities with more opportunities for all. Also speaking at the conference was Deborah Lyons, the Secretary to Ethiopia, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, today urged parties to the conflict to give a clear orders to their forces to spare and protect the civilian population from the effects of hostilities. She added the highly aggressive rhetoric on both sides regarding the fight for the city of Michele is dangerously provocative and risks placing un already vulnerable, frightened civilians in grave danger. Ms. Bachelet said she was also deeply disturbed at the continued communication back out in Tigray, making it very difficult for civilians to communicate with families and for the UN and our partners to monitor the human rights and humanitarian situation. Her full statement is online. And our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that more than 40,000 Ethiopians have not crossed into Sudan since violence broke out in Tigray. UNHCR and its partners have been able to deliver and distribute life-saving uh, aid, including food, to more, to more people. But the humanitarian response continues to face logistical challenges and remains overstretched as there is not enough shelter capacity to meet growing needs. UNHCR is also moving refugees away from the border with logistics and distances limiting the number of people that can be transferred. Inside Ethiopia, UNHCR remains concerned about civilians, including displaced populations and aid workers in Tigray. We, along with our partners, are urgently seeking $76 million until January to help 2 million people in Tigray, Afar, and Amhara regions of Ethiopia. And turning to Yemen and the issue of the Safar oil tanker, which we've been talking about for some time now. And I can tell you that we have now received an official letter from the de facto Ansar Allah authorities on Saturday indicating their approval for the UN proposal for the planned expert mission to the tanker. This, as you know, has followed several weeks of constructive technical exchanges on the activities 
that will be undertaken by the expert team. It represents an important step forward in this critical work. The objective of the UN-led expert mission is to assess the vessel and under undertake initial light maintenance, as well as to formulate recommendations on what further action is required to neutralize the risk of an oil spill. Now that the UN proposal for the expert mission has been agreed, mission planning will immediately pivot towards deployment, pre deployment preparations. This includes procurement of necessary equipment, entry permits for all staff, agreement on work order system on board, and logistical planning. The de facto authorities have assured us that they will provide all the necessary facilitation to ensure that the expert team can deploy as quickly as possible. We want to express our appreciation for the support and cooperation received to date from all parties, including the de facto authorities in Sana and the government of Yemen. We look forward to working with all stakeholders to make this critical mission a success and to start work as soon as possible. Back here in New York, uh, Janine hennis Plaschert, the Special Representative for the UN in Iraq, briefed the Security Council by video conference. She warned that several distinct yet interlinked and mutually reinforcing crises on the political, security, financial, social, and sanitary fronts continue to force the hand of the Iraqi government pressing into the crisis management mode. She said the economy is projected to contract by nearly 10 percent this year, that the impact of the pandemic has wreaked further havoc on an already extremely weak private sector activity. At the same time, she said, the efforts, any efforts to reform Iraq's economy must be accompanied by improved governance and transparency. The special representative also added that one year after the start of the protest in Iraq, that the right to freedom of expression and peaceful assembly must be defended at every turn and throughout Iraq. Turning to UNRWA, uh, Philippe Lazzarini, the head of the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, has told the agency's advisory board that the agent that UNRWA still desperately needs $70 million in contributions to avoid painful measures in the coming weeks and to limit the amount of liabilities carried over into 2021. He said that if, if it does not secure the fund for November and December salaries, the agency will continue to lack the cash needed to operate in January, according to the currently available information on 2021 contributions. UNRWA this year faces a shortfall of $115 million, including the $70 million which is needed to cover November and December salaries of over 28,000 staff. The Commissioner General was compelled last week to secure an additional $20 million from the Central Emergency Response Fund to help with cash flow and cover parts of the November payroll. Based on funds available, he will decide later this week if UNRWA proceeds with partial payment of salaries at the end of the month or delays full payment. With decreased contribution by several donors, UNRWA's shortfall in 2020 is the lowest the agency has had since 2012 while the needs of refugees are huge, especially, obviously, with the socioeconomic impact of COVID. Turning to the Central African Republic, where the members of the uh, G5 group, which includes the United Nations, member states, international institutions uh, that are partners to the country, <coughs> have welcomed the measures taken by the country to advance preparations for the December 27th elections. The measures they welcome includes the establishment of a consultation framework uh, for the adoption of a code of conduct for the media and the ongoing work of a code of conduct for political parties. They also, in the statement, also condemned all forms of violence and called on the signatories of the peace agreements in the CAR to publicly affirm their support for holding elections and to facilitate electoral operations without conditions or reservations. Finally, the G5 reaffirmed its commitment to stand alongside the Central African people and institutions to ensure success of the process. And a um, update from Zimbabwe, where our UN team, led by resident coordinator Maria Ribeiro, continues to boost the COVID-19 national health socioeconomic response. Last week alone, the World Health Organization delivered personal protective equipment, lab supplies, stationary and information technology equipment worth about $100,000 to the National Institute of Health Research. 
WHO and UNICEF also led a five-day cholera vaccination campaign targeting children's one year children one year or older. In the country uh, hunger, which in the country where hunger has become a major driver of urban urban poverty, compounded by successive droughts and pandemic. The UN Development Program and UN entities are exploring ways to advance urban farming. And our friends at the International Organization for Migration have conducted surveys to evaluate the vulnerabilities and needs of those who return to Zimbabwe as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Returnees highlighted the needs for support packages that help them reintegrate and increase access to health care services. The survey is helping put together an upcoming national support scheme for returnees. Um, and as part of the ongoing effort to support host communities in the fight against COVID-19, our colleagues at the UN Interim Force in Lebanon, UNIFIL, donated protective equipment and medical supplies to, to development centers of the southeastern towns of Frun and Rakshai al Fukar. These are expected to benefit 17 villages in the area. In addition, psychologists from one of the UNIFIL, of the UNIFIL contingents recently organized the stress management courses in southwest Lebanon for Lebanese doctors and other medical personnel who've been in the forefront of fighting the virus. And our friends at the UN mission in South Sudan are supporting the construction of a new outpatient uh, unit at Bohr Hospital, the referral facilities that is serving all of Jonglei State. The new infrastructure, which includes emergency room and a pharmacy, will be operational in January of next year. Facilities, current facilities are obviously currently overwhelmed with the arrival of additionally displaced people in need of medical attention due to the floods. Most primary health care centers in Jongle and neighboring greater Pibor administrative area have also been flooded. A uh, couple of scheduling notes to end with. I want to flag that next Wednesday, that is December 2nd, at 8.45 in the morning, the Secretary General will be speaking at Columbia University's World Leaders Forum, and he will deliver a remarks on the state of our planet. This speech will be followed by a virtual question and answer session with Columbia University students. You'll be able to watch it live on UN Web TV. And tomorrow at 11 o'clock, there'll be a virtual briefing on the forthcoming Conference of States Parties to the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which takes place uh, starting on November 30th. And tomorrow, Farhan will be in the hot seat. He'll be briefing you uh, virtually from his undisclosed location. And we will have uh, two guests, Natalia Kanem, the Executive Director of UNFPA. And she will be joined by journalist and writer Isha Sisse, who will be introduced as UNFPA's next Goodwill Ambassador. In this new role, she will help raise awareness about the global scourge of violence against women and girls, harmful practices such as female genital mutilation. And as a reminder, tomorrow is the Eliminate International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Uh, and obviously, Thursday is Thanksgiving. No one will be briefing. Uh, on Friday, we will not have a briefing, but we will be available to answer your questions. And we will be back in the briefing room on uh, Monday. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and ask them. Uh, you put my glasses. I think I see James. And whoever, who's behind James? I don't know. There as well. There are two of us in the room. Um, so, um, uh, Ethiopia, please, if I can, a couple of questions. One, the Security Council is finally going to discuss the conflict in Ethiopia. What is the Secretary General hoping the Security Council might do? Well, I can tell you, first of all, that, uh, you know, we have seen uh, and we're following the reports of a possible military action around Michele with great alarm. Uh, the Secretary General is very, very concerned about the impact that will have on civilian population, uh, on our ability uh, to deliver humanitarian aid in an area where it is also almost impossible uh, to do so. Um, and I must add that uh, we have been in touch, uh, we've been fully supportive of the African Union's um, leading role in trying to uh, diffuse uh, this situation. So 
fr from the council, we would hope to see uh, a clear, uh, a clear message calling for de-escalation, uh, calling for protection of civilian, and obviously support for uh, the African Union. A couple of follow-ups, if I can, um, and if we could perhaps get an update on the Secretary General's diplomacy on this issue, who he's been speaking to, because um, it's pretty clear from his uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights that she is concerned about this highly aggressive rhetoric, and she says that, the, that um, all parties need to give clear and unambiguous orders to spare civilians. Who in the UN, I mean, is it the Secretary General, is he having these calls? Who is passing these messages to the people of the highest level on both sides? Well, first of all, I would underscore that we fully, uh, we fully back uh, and echo uh, the, uh, the words used by the, by the High Commissioner uh, for, for Human Rights. Um, the Secretary General for the last 10 days or so, as you know, has been in touch uh, with various uh, leaders. He'd spoken to Prime Minister Abiy. Uh, we have our envoy uh, on the ground, Mr. Uh, Parker Unyanga, who's also been uh, on the phone. And I would add, uh, the Secretary General has also been in touch with uh, President Ramaphosa uh, and his, is fully backing his efforts. I think it's very important that, as you know, the African Union is in the lead and that we support their efforts. My last question on this is... Uh... Uh, Human Rights Watch have put out a statement saying there needs to be an investigation now um, uh, about discrimination against ethnic Tigrayans um, and also into the reported purge of ethnic Tigrayan peacekeepers in UN missions. This is something Credit Where Credit is Due was first reported by Foreign Policy. Can you tell us, have you confirmed that that is taking place and how concerned are you about it? Well, I would tell you that uh, we can confirm that uh, a number of uh, me three members of the Ethiopian contingent were repatriated uh, from Ethiopia uh, by Ethiopian backed by Sababa uh, from Juba. Uh, this was not coordinated with the mission. Uh, our colleagues at the mission are very, very concerned about the situation. Uh, our human rights, uh, the Human Rights Division is uh, locally is following up. Um, there have been uh, strict instructions that have been issued, uh, including that all leaves or return to home country be cleared uh, by the UN's, uh, by the, the mission's uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Division. Uh, broadly, uh, we're obviously very worried and concerned about the situation, and we're taking it extremely uh, seriously. Uh, we're trying to assert, uh, ascertain all the relevant uh, facts, and we've been in touch um, with the Ethiopian government, including the permanent, permanent mission here in, uh, in New York. I mean, it's important to, re to, to underscore that uh, all troop contributing countries have, have uh, obligations uh, when they are part of UN peacekeeping, and those need to be respected. Okay, let's spread the love. Uh, that, is that Benno behind the mask? Can you hear me? Yeah, but you can take off your you can take off your mask because I think we're we're at a safe distance, you and I. I think so. Yes, what an honor. Um, I have two questions. The first one is: the Secretary General sent a letter to the Security Council that he plans to appoint Mr. Mladenov as Libya envoy. And if I'm not mistaken, by yesterday, Monday afternoon, there should be any return um, objections, if there were any, um, to the Secretariat. So was there any, and is the appointment now imminent or not? You know, we've been talking about this appointment for quite some time, so I'm, I'm loath to use uh, qualifiers as to when we will see it. Uh, we, I do not expect to have a, to see an appointment uh, to see an appointment today. Uh, as soon as we have something to announce officially, uh, we will. And my second question is actually about vaccination. I don't know if anybody asked that question in the last weeks before, but um, can you tell me what the plans are for uh, the staff at the United Nations building here in New York being vaccinated or not? Uh, is there like a cooperation with the? City of New York, or are, are you in 
um, uh, in contact with the um, facilitators themselves, with Moderna and Pfizer, or how does that work? When do you think stuff will be vaccine? vaccinated? Well, I don't have any information. I, 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 I do not have any information when uh, such a program will, will start. We are obviously uh, remain in touch with, uh, with the city in terms of, uh, of New York. Uh, I think what is important, too, is that those who need the vaccine the most, the most vulnerable, uh, and those who are on the front lines of giving health care get the vaccine uh, first. But we are obviously looking at different options uh, to vaccinate UN staff. All right, uh, Ibtissam. Uh, hi, Steph. I have two uh, questions, two subjects. The first one is um, a follow-up on your uh, on our statement of the seventy million uh, dollars that are still uh, needed. My question is, um, why don't you call on uh, Israel as the occupation power to uh, fill this gap and pick this money? Look, uh, on UNRWA uh, obviously operates uh, in, a, in a limited area, but it remains a, it is a UN agency that operates partly on, on assessed contribution, but broadly on voluntary contributions. And we call on all member states uh, to help fund, um, fund UNRWA. Um, but, 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 I mean, I, I understand that. The thing is that... Um, According to the UN resolutions and Geneva Conventions, uh, the occupying power is responsible for the people who are under occupation. And uh, isn't it very normal to ask the, the, the party and the country who is responsible for this to finance the, uh, the refugees and uh, solve this problem? I mean, to constantly have. I, I, international, uh, obviously, international law is uh, is is what it is. Uh, but there are funding mechanisms to UN, uh, for UN agencies. These this has worked for quite some time with UNRWA, though it's always been, and especially in the last few years, in a more precarious financial situation. And we hope that those who've always given to UNRWA uh, will continue to do so in even greater amounts. Your second question. I have, I have a question on Egypt, if I may. Uh, so the Egyptian authorities, uh, um, I think last week, have arrested three staff members of the uh, Egyptian Initiative for Personal uh, Rights, including uh, Jasser Abdel Razik, Executive Director, Karim uh, Inara, Criminal Justice Unit Chief, and Mohammed Bashir, Human uh, Resources Director. Do you have any statement uh, on that? Look, we're... Look. We're very concerned about these reports of arrests uh, and treatment of these human rights defenders, including uh, three members of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal uh, Rights. Uh, the secretary, I would also refer you to what the High Commissioner has said uh, which, uh, on this issue, which the Secretary General fully backs. And you know, as the Secretary General has often said, uh, there should be no prisoners of conscience in the 20th century. No one should be arrested uh, for having a political opinion. Um, can I uh, push back a little bit here? Because, I mean, uh, we, is, from your office, we don't hear... Um, well, or let me say, put it this way. What's your message to uh, President Sisi and the fact that uh, Egypt is not only these three uh, people, uh, but also other political prisoners? Which message do you have to his... President Sisi, in this regard. Well, I mean, the, the message that we have, we have hopefully, which is what I've just, uh, which I've just said, is that they, people should not be arrested um, or detained uh, for expressing themselves and for their political views. But are you calling on their uh, relief? Really? So we're, we're 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 very concerned about uh, those arrests. We're very concerned about uh, the uh, the reports. Of their uh, of their 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 treatment, um, there has been uh, in a number of countries a um, a shrinking of the political space of the civic space, and this is what we're seeing. Now. These people should not have been arrested. Okay, uh, James. 
Um, hi, Stefan. You gave us a, a readout of the Houthis green lighting UN access to the Safa oil tanker. Um, am I right in thinking that the Houthis have given a similar green light in the past and it didn't materialize? And if that is the case, what's different this time around? No, this, this, uh, this is a significant uh, step forward, right? We had, we've had in the past um, uh, a, a kind of an intention of saying yes, uh, but there have been different steps. This was a, these were technical talks so, uh, about how this is going to work. It was, if I recall correctly, there had been a broad permission, a broad statement of saying, yes, you, you can come and, and do uh, what you need to do on the tanker, but we need to figure out the technical modality, right? And so this is a further step in the right uh, direction. Now, obviously, uh, we still have to work out the exact deployment timeline because it's going to depend on the market availability of the required equipment, the required staff, which now needs to be procured, the shipping times, and because some of the material will have to come by sea, others can be shipped in. Um, technic technicians are going to have to be hired. Now, our colleagues at UNOPS have uh, under their belt a market analysis already, so they know where to get the material, they know where to get the, the people, uh, but the, these uh, timelines uh, need, to, need to be worked out. I think if everything comes together, uh, we would expect the mission staff and the equipment to arrive on site uh, by late January or early uh, early February. Okay, uh, Philippe Rater. Hello, Stefan. Can you give us an update on uh, Western Sahara? Still fire? Still? Uh, do you have any any numbers of casualties? Does uh, Minurso is still in Gergerat? Thank yes, you. so uh, Minurso is still uh, present throughout the territory, including in Gergarat. Uh, we are, they're obviously continuing to monitor uh, the situation. We also continue to receive uh, reports of sporadic shots being fired, and that's along the northern and eastern portions of the berm. Uh, these incidents have taken place mostly uh, at night. Um, the mission is obviously continuing to uh, be in contact with all the relevant stakeholders. And our message continues to be clear is that the parties need to take all necessary steps to diffuse tensions, to remove all obstacles uh, to the resumption of the political process. Um, so that's that's the update that I, um, that I have. Okay, let me go back to the screen. Uh, Evelyn? And then Maggie. Yes, hello. Uh, hello, Steph. Thank you. Um, I want to ask a, about a different aspect of violence against women. Is there any approach to the new Biden team to stop opposite, opposition to reproductive health programs, to absence-only programs, and other wide-ranging restrictions on women's health? Sorry, can, can you repeat the first part of the question? Um, I just asked a different aspect of violence against women. Uh, is there any approach to the new Biden team to stop opposition to reproductive health programs, abstinence-only programs, and a pile of other restrictions on women's health? Well, I, mean, I, I think at that uh, it, it's, a, it's a very valid question, uh, and I would encourage you to save it for Natalie Canham at UNFPA uh, tomorrow, who would be able to to tell you if that is actually the the case. It's not just UNFPA. No, no, I know, but she would be in the lead on that. Uh, so I'm not aware of any uh, of any contacts with the Biden campaign, uh, the Biden, excuse me, the the president elect uh, team uh, on those. Uh, on particular issues, but it doesn't mean uh, you should ask Natalie. She would uh, probably uh, know. Okay. Uh, Maggie, okay. have you withdrawn your question or do you still want to take the floor? No, I have a new question. 
Good for you. You're so creative. <laughs> okay. Just a quick follow-up to Benno's. Um, whatever happened with the Russian offer to vaccinate all the UN staff? Have you pursued that? Yes, we're continuing to be uh, in discussion and looking at that uh, at that offer. Okay, uh, Abdel Hamid, I see you scratching your head or waving your hand. I was waving my hand. Thank you. Today, there was a crisis in East Mediterranean. I think there is a German ship intercepted a Turkish vessel, and there was some tension, and Turkey is summoning members of the European Council for a meeting. Are you aware of this incident, and do you have anything to say? All, all I've seen is I've, um, I, I mean, I've seen the press reports of issues involving a German Navy uh, ship and a uh, Turkish flag. Uh, tanker, I mean, uh, uh, cargo ship, rather. Um, I, we have no particular information on that, except I would use this opportunity to reiterate uh, the fact that it is critical uh, that all member states fully respect uh, the embargo on, uh, on uh, arms embargo on Libya. My second question, Mr. Tan, uh, do you have any update on the uh, Constitutional Committee of uh, the Syrian Inter-Syrian dialogue. Are they doing any progress? Not, not at this point. But there may be some updates later this week. But I have nothing. Uh, I have nothing to, to share with you. And my last question: the answer is yes or no. There was an incident in an uh, in a, a mosque in northern Nigeria. Where there was an attack, and a couple of people were killed. I wasn't here last week, so I just want to inquire if there was a statement in that. Um, I didn't see that particular uh, report, but I'm happy to look into it. Uh, Hussein uh, Ibrahim, Hussein. Can you hear me, Steph? Yes, I can hear you. I can't yeah. see you, but I can hear you. Good afternoon. So regarding the Iranian-backed Houthi militia attacks on oil facilities in the city of Jeddah in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia two days ago, what is the Secretary General position on these attacks? Is there a clear condemnation <clears throat> of what the Houthis are doing, especially when it comes to threatening global oil, oil supplies? Yes, I think, as you may have seen, um, the Secretary General expressed his concern over that uh, missile attack that you uh, referred to on the Aramco facility in Saudi Arabia. And we saw, uh, the, we saw the clear claim of responsibility. <laughs> uh, it bears recalling that attacks targeting civilian targets and infrastructure violate international humanitarian law. Once again, the Secretary General calls upon all actors to exercise maximum restraint to demonstrate a serious commitment to engage in the UN facilitated uh, talks, the political process, and all of that to reach a negotiated political settlement. Uh, to end the conflict, and most importantly, to end the, suffer the long suffering of the people of Yemen. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, I will turn it over to Brendan. Brendan, it's all yours. Question, Steph. Steph, I think James Bayes has a question. Yes, yeah, sorry, James. I was trying to escape. I, I know. <laughs> it's not Thanksgiving yet. I know you're not here tomorrow. Um, uh, anyway, um, some follow-up questions, if I can. Um, yeah. The first one, on as, as we were there just now, on that, uh, on that attack on Saudi Arabia, um, You'll remember before when we had a similar incident, there was an investigation by experts. Is there any similar investigation planned? The Saudi ambassador has now written a letter, which I think is copied to the Secretary General, to the President of the Security Council. Do you think something will be arranged like that? I, I'm not aware of it, but let me take a look at the, take a look at the letter. Okay. Uh, staying with the Houthis and the Safa tanker, I am a little amazed that we've been told for years that this was an imminent environmental 
disaster. And now, after all of this hard work and diplomacy by Martin Griffiths and others to get access, it's going to take until the end of January to procure the right equipment and the right personnel. Surely the UN had all of this arranged, everything on tap, ready, the people all ready to go, because, as we were told, this was an imminent environmental disaster. Well, you know, on that, uh, a couple of points that need to be made. Um, we cannot spend the donor money until there was a plan that was approved, which is now. We, ha we have a market feasibility study, so we know where everything is, but we cannot spend a penny on uh, getting the equipment uh, and the personnel, which you can imagine uh, is very technical. The kind of equipment you need is not stuff you can pick up at, uh, at Home Depot or your local DIY store. Um, so the, 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 the time frame was always that, that we have the market, we have the market study, we know where to get things. So, some of these parts are going to have to be sh um, uh, shipped by, by sea. That takes some time. Uh, tugboats are going to have to be leased. We were not able, and we cannot spend donor money on, for example, on leasing a tugboat for eight months or six months while we waited for the permissions. That's just not how the process works in terms of how we are able to uh, to work and to spend uh, to spend the money. So we are everything was indeed lined up, and we're working as fast as possible. Um, to do with Mr. Mladenov. Um, you weren't particularly forthcoming when Benno asked his question. Um, we are well aware that the Security Council had a, had a silence procedure and it was Russia that broke silence and said that Mr. Mladenov, they didn't want him appointed until his appointment was also, um, his replacement was also chosen. Um, so the question, to, the questions to you, um, how close is the Secretary General to finding that other job, Mr. Mladenov's replacement? Will he um, announce the two now together? And then overall, another Security Council member putting a spanner in the works. How frustrated is the Secretary General by this whole process? I mean, to say that we would have wanted to see a permanent leadership in that mission quite some time ago would be an understatement. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Stephanie Williams, uh, who is, you have seen by what she's been able to accomplish, has not been a caretaker. She has been a firmly in charge and doing, uh, doing really fantastic work. We are working with this, within the system that we have, with the member states that we have. Um, we listen to member states and... We uh, try to meet their uh, requirements and their, their needs, and the Secretary General is working full steam on trying to meet all of the requests of the member states. I'm trying to be diplomatic, and I hope I was. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Brendan, uh, your turn. Thank you, Stefan.